Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We take a look at everything from what's up in the night sky to equipment, to helpful tips and tricks for visual and imaging. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. So it is the first weekend of the month, or first Friday of the month. Hey, Friday! Um, and we're happy to be here. Thanks for joining us for your Friday morning. Um, if you've never been with us before, welcome. Uh, this is the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. These episodes are generally live, uh, but they are recorded. So if you miss something or you want to go back and check something out, you can always go back into the catalog of library here on our YouTube channel and check out any episode of the What's Up webcast that you might want to see. Um, but again, thanks for spending your Friday morning with us. If you've been here before, thanks for being with us. Happy Friday. Uh, Another thing I'd like to talk about real quick is our website. Um, if you actually want to subscribe to our website, ba-ding, right up there, um, you can get on our email list. It keeps you up to date with any new equipment stuff or our weekly webcasts or anything like that. That's up there. Um, so go ahead and check that out. Um, we definitely appreciate having you here. And of course, you can always go ahead and subscribe to the channel um, right here on YouTube. And that definitely helps us out, especially if you leave a like on the videos that also keeps us doing what we're doing, tells management that we're doing good numbers. Um, and if you have any questions, go ahead and email info at skywatcherusa.com and you can title it what's up or whatever you want um, at that point. And we'll get back to you as soon as possible on that. So if you have any questions on equipment, go ahead and email support at skywatcherusa.com. So hopefully that helps. Get back through here real quick. We'll get back on track. Subscribe to our email. Now it's August. No idea where the year went, as I'm sure many of you feel the same. And as we do every month, the first thing we start off with is the moon. Biggest, brightest object in the nighttime sky. Why not start with that? Now the full, I'm sorry, the new moon is August 7th, tomorrow actually. And that is the best time to get out and start observing uh, for your dark sky weekend. It just happens to be new moon is on a Saturday. Uh, so this weekend would be the weekend to get out to your local dark sky site, do some imaging, capture some Milky Way um, shots, or just do some observing with some friends. This would be the dark weekend of August to do that. So hopefully you've got some plans. Hopefully your weather's good. Um, but hopefully you can get out and do some kind of viewing, even if it's in your backyard. And full moon, of course, is August 22nd, and yay for full moon. Um, but yes, if you're looking to get out, do some dark sky viewing, this is going to be the weekend to do it. Hopefully you already have some plans figured out by the time it's already Friday, so hopefully you've got it figured out. Maybe you're in the process of loading your car right now, so that might be something you could do too. Now, like I said, for full moon is August 22nd, so end of the month. Uh, and it is the sturgeon moon, named after the big fish. Um, large sturgeon fish, they're found all over the place, but um, where the folklore really originates is around like the Great Lake region. Um, and this is the time of year that they were generally caught or are generally caught. I live up there, so I couldn't tell you much about it. Um, Corn moon and the harvest moon, it depends on what Native American tribe um, that the folklore or the timing is based on. Um, generally, the harvest moon would be reserved for September, October-ish, depending on kind of how the time frame works. Um, it just depends on the region that the folklore originated from is where it gets its name from. And you can always go to Farmer's Almanac. Um, that's where I get all the names and folklore behind that. It's also kind of fun to do um, if you're doing an outreach event. You want to talk about the monthly full moon and whatever its name is. Uh, it's fun to get some of the folklore behind that and tell people about it. So something neat. Uh, but that is the full moon of the month, the Sturgeon moon, and that is on August 22nd. So you've got some time to get some deep sky viewing um, done before we get to the bright full moon again. Uh, so get out there and check it out. 
planets. Um, there are still some planets visible. Um, we finally got rid of Mars. It took long enough. Um, but Venus, I'm sure if you've been out over the last few weeks, you know, right after sunset, I'm sure you've seen the big bright planet Venus shining brightly just after sunset in the uh, west. Sorry, I got my directions mixed up. Um, it is going to slowly move over to more to the southwest and get closer as it gets brighter. Uh, but that is the uh, easiest planet to see right now, right after sunset. It's still in a gibbous phase. It's probably going to be there for a while. Uh, but you can uh, pick it up uh, just after sunset. Let me get my program here. This is east. There we go. Um, Venus is right up here. Boop. Uh, almost due west. Um, this is right around 7 o'clock p.m. So, but it, it will be visible still um, till about, you know, 8.30-ish. Um, but over the month, throughout the month, it's going to start moving more to the southwest. There's kind of a conjunction, kind of a cool conjunction there on um, the 10th. It's not super close, but a very razor thin uh, crescent moon with Venus will be visible on the 10th. So next week, um, you can catch that. Might be a cool little uh, moment. And then as we get to the 11th, it kind of spaces out, so it's not as far. But you'll have some cool crescent moon and Venus visible on the 10th and the 11th next week if you want to check that out um, as the moon becomes more of an evening object. Uh, as we move into next week and getting that crescent moon there. Uh, but Venus is still there as the month progresses, as you can see. It's going to get lower as it gets later, uh, but it tends to get brighter as well. So, uh, But Venus will be part of the sky for the next few months as, you know, as we move on. So, but that is the planet Venus. So let me get this out of the way. Boop. And our next planet is Jupiter. Now we are getting the planets back up in the evening sky. Um, Jupiter, finally, we're getting some cool stuff uh, visible. That's going to be rising in the east. Saturn's actually in front of it, but we'll get to Saturn in a minute. Um, so right around, well, this is late in the month. Let me back up here real quick. Sixth. There we go. So right around 8 o'clock, Jupiter's just peeking up over the horizon in the east. And as we get to about closer to 10 o'clock, it's getting nice and high to where it's easily visible. It's a good time to start observing it. Um, but it's going to be hanging out there in the southeast. You should know where Jupiter is roughly. Uh, it's very bright. It's easy to see naked eye. It's a great object for any size telescope. Um, so give that a shot. The moons, if you've never observed the moons, particularly if you just got your first telescope, the Galilean moons are very fun to watch as they change throughout the night. And night to night, you can sketch it. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. And if you're a planetary imager, now's the time to start getting ready for that because the planets are going to be visible more of a evening hour rather than very early in the morning. So uh, Jupiter is going to be nice in position probably around 10 o'clock um, in the early part of the month. And then, of course, as we get later into the month, you know, it's going to be practically after sunset. Jupiter will be in a nice position to start viewing um, right as the sun goes down. So about 8 o'clock towards the end of the month, it'll be a nice object sitting out there in the eastern part of the sky. Now, Saturn. Saturn's actually in front of Jupiter. Um, these two are going to be a pair of... Uh, moving uh, right now across the sky throughout the rest of the planet season, essentially. Um, so this one's going to be coming up around 8.30. Pop this back. Go back to the 6 there. There we go. So right after sunset, about 8 o'clock. I guess that depends on where you're at. Uh, you got Saturn finally up in the nighttime sky. Uh, awesome planet to view especially if this is your first year of doing astronomy and you haven't had a chance to really catch uh the big planets uh saturn is probably one of the most popular planets in the sky because of the rings and really any size telescope can catch it 
Uh, ideally, you want to probably be about 100 power or more uh, as far as magnification goes for planets to get you know, a nice image scale on it. But you can get a good view of Saturn in a wide variety of telescopes. So that's going to be a cool one. And of course, it's going to be rising higher and higher into the sky as the month progresses. But definitely towards mid to end of the month, you're, you know, right after sunset, Saturn's going to be really well placed. So you can just start right as the evening gets started. You can get out and be observing Saturn and actually Jupiter towards the end of the month. Those are going to be two very well placed planets uh, for you to start catching um, in the evening. Now, again, when it comes to conjunctions, not super close, uh, but on the 21st, you've got a very bright moon and Jupiter kind of hanging out near each other. And then obviously a few days before that, rewind this, you've got on the 20th, you've got Saturn and a very bright gibbous moon uh, hanging out with each other out there. Not super close, but in the region. So, you know, kind of a something neat to see. And then uh, let's see the twenty. Nope, we covered that. So yeah, it jumps from basically Saturn on the twentieth to Jupiter on the twenty-first, and as it moves into full moon on the twenty-second. So uh, those are the big planets that are up right now. Excellent targets to observe with pretty much any size telescope. It does get nice when you get up to about a four or five inch telescope because you do get the resolution that you're looking for. And if you can get up to a hundred power. 150 depending on your local seeing conditions or more you can see some really interesting detail um, especially in the cloud bands on Jupiter but Saturn will show some very nice details as well um, so very nice to finally have some planets back up in the sky to check out so those are the major planets Venus Jupiter and Saturn are really all the major stuff that's up right now but those are the ones that everyone really wants to catch for the most part uh, anyway, so a very good time to start observing planets. The sun. Uh, the sun has been kicking up a little bit. Um, we've seen some pretty cool images start to come up from a variety of different uh, imagers and astronomers. Now, I just keep the slides the same on this, uh, ultimately, because we're actually going to pull up a live, not a live, but almost live uh, view of what the sun's doing right now. Uh, the sun is a great object to observe. Obviously, it's very convenient for a lot of us because it's during the day. It's also warmer for the most part. Um, but it is a great object to view. You can sketch it, you can image it, and it's very dynamic because it changes hour by hour and day by day. So excellent, excellent target to, to observe. Now, if you want to know if it's worth kind of lugging out all your stuff, um, I go to this website, This I just type in gong, G-O-N-G, H-alpha, into like Google, and this pops up. And these are fairly live images of the sun from multiple observatories around the world. And the nice thing is you can click on that, and see what's going on. Um, obviously today there's not a lot of surface activity, but there's a fair amount of prominences kind of dancing around the edge of the sun. So might be something worth looking at. But this is what I would use. This is the website I recommend if you are interested in observing. Um, I will say this is in hydrogen alpha um, light. So, you know, like Coronado PST, Lunt filters, uh, Daystar. Um, any of those are really the only way you're going to be able to see the sun like it's presented on the monitor here. And uh, if you have a white light filter, you're not going to be able to see some of these prominences. You're not going to see any prominences for the most part. Um, you will get some sunspots, but we don't have anything going on right now. But uh, this is, if you do have an H-alpha filter, this is what I use to see if it's worth kind of lugging out everything to check it out if you don't already have the luxury of having it set up. Now, uh, if you don't know about solar filters and you're not sure what I'm talking about, we do have several episodes that we've covered solar filters in the past, different types of filters, what they're used for. You can go back and check out those episodes um, here at the What's Up webcast. But this uh, website is the Gong H Alpha uh, displays from multiple observatories. So if you have an H Alpha filter, this is what I go on to see what's going on out there if it's worth taking a look at stuff. So very good resource to have. I highly recommend this website to anybody who's serious about solar observing. Meteor showers. 
it's August. August is the pinnacle of meteor showers. This is the one everybody waits for, and it is the Perseid meteor shower. Um, the peak of the meteor shower is actually next week, the 11th through the 13th. Uh, but if you are getting out to dark sky, actually, it's actually a very well-timed meteor shower right now, now that I think about it, because generally the best time to observe a meteor shower is after midnight when the Earth is kind of moving into the stream of a meteor shower, and at least from the observer's perspective. So after midnight is generally the best time to observe a meteor shower. The Perseid meteor shower this year lines up to where the moon is a very faint crescent moon that actually sets before midnight, so you don't have to worry about any of that. So the skies are gonna be very nice and dark to get out and actually observe uh, the Perseids and see if you can get anything. Uh, we're talking about 50 meteors per hour, roughly. So it's one of the, if not the largest meteor shower of the year. Um, and because it's so well placed as far as the moon phases, uh, if you can get out this weekend and go watch it, maybe you can get your camera out, uh, mirrorless or DSLR camera, nice wide angle lens. That's the best way to capture some pictures of it. So definitely worthwhile to get out. If you're not sure where to actually look on that. Let's actually go after midnight here and let's actually bring us back to and at a work or maybe we'll just do this weekend so this is where the Perseids are going to be coming from you're going to be looking northeast uh this is right after midnight or so uh the constellation of perseus the hero is actually what you're looking for pop all the labels up here here's perseus uh, if you can find cassiopeia it's just below that not far from where the double cluster is actually coming from there's some really cool pictures you could do because you have the, the double cluster and andromeda and a bunch of stuff in this area so if you're looking to get a cool shot um you could use like a sky tracker and just follow that region of the sky and get some cool images from there uh, there's a bunch of cool shots you could do with a very wide angle lens something like a 14 1635 um something wide that's going to allow you to catch any meteors coming by uh, through night. So that's what I would recommend doing if you want to actually do some imaging to capture some meteors. Other than that, just drive out to a dark sky with some friends or family. Just hang out and watch it. You don't need any telescopes. You don't need any optics. Just lay there and watch it. It's kind of something fun to do if you're looking for something to do, especially away from people. Um, this weekend. So that would be my recommendation if you're looking to get out and do some uh, observing this weekend. You also happen to work it out to where the Perseid meteor shower is actually starting to peak. Um, so good time to get out and stuff this weekend. Comets. Now there's a wide, there's always comets up in the nighttime sky. Uh, now it depends on are they worth looking at? This is what I use, cometchasing.skyhound.com. This is a very well updated website. It's got a big list of comets, gives you some notes on them. And there's also different uh, charts down here, it gives you all different kinds of perspectives on what's going on. I don't think there's anything really, it's, it's especially here in the Northern hemisphere at the moment. At this time, looking at the notes, there's not a lot going on or easily visible comets. So if you come down here, here's all the notes and such for each of the major comets. You have C2020 T2 Palomar. Uh, it does say this is an evening comet. It's in the constellation of Virgo, so it's well placed at the moment, but it's only magnitude 10. Um, this is a definite telescope object. The uh, naked eye, best uh, naked eye visual, uh, I'm sorry. The faintest magnitude the human eye can see is about seven. So this is far below what a naked eye uh, comet would be. Um, you could probably get it in like a four inch telescope, but it's probably gonna be fairly small. But the cool thing about this website is you can go down here, learn the positions, and then you can go to the finder chart and it'll tell you where it's gonna be um, over the next several days. So it's a very cool uh, chart. This is really nice if you're looking to hunt some obscure stuff. Uh, but it will keep you up to date if you're looking for anything particular, uh, especially when we get a bright comet up. It's a very good resource to have. But highly recommend this if you're into comet observing and you want to check out what's up. 
or maybe you want to just image one of these comets, uh, this is it, cometchasing.skyhound.com. So if we go down the list, you have C2020T2, that's 10th magnitude, which is the brightest comet in the Northern Hemisphere right now. That's, you're looking at at least a four inch telescope right there. Uh, next one is in Taurus, that's 11th magnitude. They're saying an eight inch telescope, that's probably not, probably about accurate. Uh, then we get the 13.3 with C2017 K2, that 10 inch telescope, and so on and so forth. The comets just get fainter and harder to see, but if you're into finding them, um, it's kind of a fun challenge um, to see them, but it actually has notes telling you as far as your latitude where you can see them. Um, but yeah, this is a great website if you're into comet observing, I highly recommend uh, checking this out. Again, this is cometchasing.skyhound.com. Hopefully that helps. And that's it for comets. There's not a lot of big things right now. Now that is always subject to change with comets. You can have a comet that has an outgassing, so it gets really bright. You can have a new comet discovered. Um, comets are very fluid as far as how things can change. So if you're into comets, this is a good website to keep an eye on because it changes all the time and things with comets change all the time so definitely worth keeping an eye on you never know when we're gonna have our next big comet like we did a year ago that was amazing but yeah that's it for comets now deep sky um, August is a very eclectic month as far as deep sky goes we're still very heavily in the summer uh, skies you have a lot of the major stuff um, up of course the Milky Way is prime season right after sunset it's easy to catch from a dark sky site uh, looking south let me just pull this up here real quick so for example right around any uh eight o'clock um you can see the milky way is nice and high right after sunset ready to go um you have the Milky Way, you have Scorpio, Sagittarius, all the major stuff is well placed right now. So anything you want to be doing right now for your favorite summertime objects in Scorpius, Sagittarius, Ophiuchus, Aquila, Scutum, Sagittaria, um, Cygnus, all the major players up here for all those uh, summertime jewels, now is the time to get it. It's, you still have enough time where you can actually image some of these objects. You know, if you want to do like the Lagoon or something like that, you can always check it out um, right there but now is the time you still have a fair amount of uh, time to actually do a nice image of an object for most of the summertime objects right now so definitely August is definitely the time especially early August of course as we as we get later in the month you're gonna get the moon that's gonna wipe all of that out so um, but everything right now let's see if I can pull this up. Yeah, it's not what I was looking for. Um, but you want to make sure that you're on the meridian uh, with these things right here. And the nice thing about a lot of these early uh, or these summer objects, particularly in the south, is right now they are still in front of the meridian, um, which is kind of that imaginary line that separates uh, rising from the east, setting in the south or in the west. The meridian right there splits the sky in half. Right now, a lot of the major objects are still on the east side of the meridian, so you still have got time to image them through the rest of the night, get a couple hours on those objects. So now's the time to really dig into it. Towards the end of the month, we're gonna have a bright moon, you're not gonna be able to get it, and a lot of those are gonna be on the western side of the meridian, where you'll still have some time, but you're gonna start running into the end of the season um, here pretty quick. But the thing about August is while we're still heavily invested in the summertime stuff, we still have Pegasus coming up, Cassiopeia's coming up, Cepheus is nice and high. Um, there's a lot of that fall autumn stuff that's not far around the corner and it's already coming up into the nighttime sky by eight or, or nine o'clock. You know, a lot of the major stuff in Cepheus, this is the time to hit it. If you wanna go after one of those dusty nebulas that are up in Cepheus, actually now's the time to start digging into it because you have most of the entire night to actually image that region of the sky 
Um, and of course, Pegasus will become more visible and higher as we move towards September. So um, that's why I was saying it's eclectic because you still have a lot of these summertime gems. You still have some of the spring stuff, you know, some of the galaxies and Virgo and uh, Virgo's about done about 930. So, but you still can get some of that. You got Hercules, but um, all the major summertime stuff is awesome right now, but you're gonna start getting some of those real uh, nice autumn objects up um, by the end or early evening, like 9.30. So um, keep an eye on it, especially if you're looking to image something. Uh, one of those targets, of course, is M13. I had to throw this in here because M13 is just M13. It's an easy object to see if you're a new uh, a newbie. Uh, you can see it in pretty much any size telescope. 50 millimeter binoculars, you can catch it easy from a dark sky site. You can see this from in town with like a six inch telescope, probably even smaller than that actually, but it's an easy object to see and it's spectacular in a dark sky site. So very fun object to observe. I never get tired of it. But it's, a, it's just one of those that you always want to go back to this time of year. And that, of course, is in the constellation of uh, Hercules. And it is on the western side of Hercules. So you're going to find Corona Borealis, the northern crown. This kind of points you to the body of Hercules, which is called the Keystone. And right there. Oh, well, actually, we'll lock on to it. Well, anyway, it's close enough. Right there, take her. Corona Borealis loop around and it points you right to where M13 should be. Um, or you just use your go-to telescope and put M13 and it goes and finds it. Fun in that. That's M13, uh, 22,000 light years away from the Earth. It's an awesome object to see and it's really just one of those summertime objects that you have to observe a couple times. Now, sitting down in the that core of the Milky Way, Sagittarius area I was telling you about, we have the Trifid Nebula. Uh, it's a, down in Sagittarius. It's 5,200 light years away. This is an awesome object because of how dynamic it is. It has the blue reflection nebula. It has the pink emission nebula. It's got some dark nebulas and a stunning star field. So if you're into imaging, this is an awesome object. It's not too difficult to do. Um, dark skies help, but you can do some light pollution filters. It, can work with narrow band filters as well, um, but I think for visual or visible light is probably the better way to go about it or one shot color. But it is a um, stunning object to actually capture an image of. So, and for visual, it's good in a wide range of op or optics. Uh, 150 millimeters, so six inch uh, roughly would be the starting point. Dark skies are a real big advantage to this object. Um, it's fainter than I think a lot of people think it is. Uh, this blue emission nebula is invisible practically to the eye, but you're going to be looking for the pink emission nebulas and you can see the dark lanes that actually run through there. It's a very cool object to see, but dark skies are really what you want for this object. It's difficult in town to really get any kind of structure um, unless you've got a camera on the telescope. So visually it's a fun object, but Bigger aperture, six inch plus would be my recommendation, and then nice skies uh, for it. Now, right next door, actually, let me just pull this up here real quick so you guys know where this is at. I'm sure many of you do, um, but now's the time where you can still get it. It's in a very good position. Um, right here is the Trifid. Uh, right up here above Sagittarius there, right in the core of the Milky Way. Um, but right next door, you have the Lagoon Nebula, M8, which is a much bigger, much brighter object. It's usually a two for one deal when you're observing these. Uh, if you've got a wide field refractor, um, give this a shot in a dark sky site. It's pretty impressive actually. Uh, so something to check out there. But these two are normally a pair. So M8, the Lagoon Nebula is also in Sagittarius. It actually has nothing to do with the Trifid physically. Trifid's about 1,000-ish light years behind it, roughly. Um, then you have uh, M8, or the Lagoon, which is 4,100 light years away. That is a typo there, um, not 150 millimeter. You can see this in a three-inch telescope or a pair of binoculars in dark skies. It's a stunning wide field object. There's all kinds of knots and details. 
this one is easier to see because of how much brighter it is. Um, so even in the uh, brain fogging out on me, um, even in the city with like a UHC filter or some kind of nebula filter, this is still somewhat doable. You can still see the glow. I would kind of equate this to almost being the summertime version of Orion. Not as bright, not as dynamic, but it is something that you can still see easily from in town. You can image it from in town. Uh, if you're into narrow band imaging, it's got a lot going for it because there's a lot of different emissions that are coming from this nebula. But it's an easy target to do. And of course, if you're in a dark sky site, it's fantastic and a wide variety of telescopes. Um, but And what I'm going to start doing in the presentations here before, here's a higher res uh, image of that rather than just being a little cut out um, on the side there. So you can actually get some sense of the structures and stuff in these nebulas. Um, this is the Lagoon Nebula. This is just, you know, color, visual light image. Obviously, if you're observing it, there's not going to be color. It's just going to be gray. Um, but you can see there's a lot of dark nebulas, lots of wisps, all kinds of details, and a very staggering star field that it sits within. So if you've got a wide field telescope and you're on the lagoon, it's there's a lot going on in there. And then like I said earlier, it sits right next to M8. So here's a stitch of those two shots together. You can see how close they actually sit with each other. Um, this is a mosaic from our observatory, a Spree 150, a ZWO 6200 full frame camera. But with a thousand millimeter focal length, even with that big chip, you can see they're not that far from each other. So if you're using like a crop sensor on like a short refractor, you can get both of these together. Maybe you're shooting with like a star adventurer or some kind of tracker and you've got like a 200 millimeter telephoto, excellent target to go after. Um, because of how dynamic that star field is. And you can get a bunch of this uh, nebulosity in there. The lagoon, there's actually a little bit of, it uh, goes up to another object up here, which I, I don't have data on at the moment. Um, but the lagoon actually stretches up higher there to another, I think it's an IC object. Um, but these two nebulas are kind of a two for one deal if you're looking to image something cool with a telephoto or something like that. So that is M8 and M20. Probably two of the major gems this time of year uh, over in the Sagittarius Scorpio area in the core there. Now, like I said before, we are getting to that point where certain objects are starting to come around in the later part of the evening. And one of those, of course, is Andromeda M31. It's the easiest galaxy to see. You can see it naked eye um, from a nice dark sky. If you're out observing this weekend, um, obviously in the early evening, you're going to be really busy with a lot of the summertime stuff. But as you get towards midnight, a little bit after midnight, you will see this bright glow coming out from Andromeda. If you're in a dark enough sky, you can see it naked eye. And that is the Andromeda galaxy starting to show up as it creeps up a little bit further. Let's kind of, yeah, it's, I mean, it is above the horizon. It's rising right after sunset. It technically breaks the horizon by, you know, 8.30. It's, it's low, but it's up there. But once you get to about nine or 9.30, you should actually start to see the glow in a dark sky, you'll be able to see it. And then right around 10, 10.30, it's gonna be high enough to where you can get a telescope on it and still get a good view of it. Um, but it's gonna be hanging out right over here and then by the time we get to 11 and midnight, it's it's high enough where you can start imaging on it. And right now, because of where it's placed, you could image this target starting around 11 o'clock. You can get a whole image in one night. Or if you're doing luminance, you can do two hours of luminance and one hour of color if you're doing a one or a monochrome setup, or you can just pound away on it for hours until about 4.30 in the morning is usually about where astronomical dawn is, at least for our region. You have to check with that, but it is way overhead by the time you start to get to sunrise. So if you're looking to image Andromeda or get a real crazy deep shot of Andromeda, starting around 11 o'clock right now is the time to start getting on it. Um, this is also taken with our 
Osprey 150, uh, ZWO 6200, actually two telescopes, uh, two Osprey 150s, one that has a color and one that has a luminance, um, and then combining the data, but this is only an hour and a half worth of exposure time. So if you've got a wide field telescope and a nice dark sky, you can really go after it. Star Adventure, some small tracker, with a telephoto lens like a 200 millimeter or a red cat you can get an awesome awesome wide field shot of andromeda but now is the season it's starting to come up around 11 so be aware so we all the summertime objects are still very much present some of those big showcase objects for the fall are starting to actually make their way into the uh, sky right now so keep an eye out for it something cool to see now, working over to Cepheus, I really like Cepheus because there's all kinds of weird stuff in Cepheus. Lots of nebulas, lots of weird nebulas, lots of dusty stuff up there, which I think is really cool. But this is the Cave Nebula, or Sharpless 155. Um, this one's probably a bit of a challenge visually. You probably want to be in a dark sky site. I'd probably say at least an 8-inch telescope to see if some of these brighter regions um, probably a UHC or O3 filter to sneak some of the detail out, but it's an amazing uh, imaging target if you're looking to do it. It's 2,400 light years away. It's a very wide field target. This is um, with our Esprit 150, this is H alpha. So it's an amazing narrow band object. So even if the moon is coming up later in the, uh, the month, this is a great object to actually shoot even with narrow band. It does well with both visible light, like one shot color, or you could do narrow band on it. So it's, it's good for both, uh, but it should be a challenging visual object. I'll have to try it out sometime. I haven't had the chance to really dig into something like this, um, but there's some very nice detail in, in the cave nebula there. I'll bring up the bigger shot. You can see a lot of these dark nebulas regions up in there, but some very cool details in there but this shot doesn't even do it justice because of how much wider you could go if you've got this is a thousand millimeter at full frame something like 500 millimeters or you know telephoto lens there's a lot of stuff going on in this region so it's a great wide field target and it's actually up early in the evening uh, sitting out there in the north uh, right up here with cepheus this is early in the morning so right around 8.30, Cepheus is, by the time it's dark enough to start imaging, astronomical twilight, what that's called, Cepheus is nice and high. And the cave nebula, I think this is it right here. Right or is it, or is it up here? No. Uh, right down here is where the cave nebula is, so it's low part of Cepheus. I'm sorry, it's right here. It's not far from the bubble. Uh, nebula actually but this is what I'm talking about there's stuff all over Cepheus a bunch of weird stuff in Cepheus a lot of dusty stuff if you could take a whole shot of Cepheus you'd be impressed what's sitting up in there um, but right around so like astronomical twilight is around 940 right now for at least where I'm at it'll vary from your region um, so let's say we're gonna be shooting that's not what I want I don't satellite I'll just shoot this um, right up in here is where our object is. You can go all night, all night, literally all night from uh, astronomical twilight to astronomical dawn. You can hit Cepheus all night. So if you want to be imaging some of these dusty targets in Cepheus, now's the time to do it because you can go all night on it. You will have the meridian flip there. Um, so that's something to keep an eye out on. But if you're looking to get something like this, you can go for a while. I think this is like four hours of hydrogen alpha detail um, right here. So I need to add a little bit more, but very good object. And if you are in town, you can use narrowband filters because it's an emission nebula. It works very, very well. So even if the moon is up, you can go after something like the cave nebula. Now, not far from the cave nebula, right up in that Cepheus region, is the bubble nebula it's a, technically in cassiopeia um, but it's right next door right up here
it's over here. Cassiopeia, but it's still within the boundary of Cassiopeia. So definitely um, a very cool object to take a look at. One of my favorites though, it's a very complex region. You have a bunch of nebulosity in here. You have very bright star clusters. I think this is M52 is in this region. If I'm not mistaken uh, that that's the open cluster. It should be right there. Yep, M52. Uh, so Messier 52 is right there, which you can actually see in the image right up in there. But there's a lot that goes on near the bubble. And the bubble is a very cool region because you can actually capture either a wide field view. Here's the high res shot. There's a wide field. You can even go wider than this. There's all kinds of nebulosity and stuff in here that you could catch. Or if you want to just focus in on the bubble, let's say you have like a longer focal length, something like a Schmidt or one of those RC telescopes, or maybe you just don't have a big sensor and it's on eight or nine or thousand millimeter, you can get a really cool shot of just the bubble itself. Um, so the bubble nebula is a very cool nebula to actually image because you can shoot it in a wide variety of focal lengths and it's gonna look interesting in all the different focal lengths. Depends on how you want the look. If you wanna just be the bubble, you can go higher res. If you wanna go wide field, there's a lot of really neat things out there too. So bubble's very dynamic. It is possible to observe the bubble as well. Now, you can probably get some of the brighter regions here. I've seen the little arc right here. I think it was about a 14 inch telescope we were using. It is a challenge um, to see it. So I would probably reserve this for probably a 12 inch or bigger. You could get something that's got serious aperture on it, probably 14 or north of 14 or even something that's 18, 20 or bigger would be a very interesting observation. I'd probably recommend like a UHC, the ultra high contrast to help pop it out a little bit. There's a lot of oxygen three in the bubble itself. So you could probably use an O3 filter but O3 filters tend to knock out a fair amount of light because it is a narrow band filter. And if you're gonna go after the bubble with an oxygen three filter, I'd probably say you wanna be up in that 14 inch plus aperture range or bigger. Um, more aperture, the better for this to see what you can get out of it. It would be very interesting to see this in like a 20 inch or larger telescope. But if you wanna observe the bubble, it's kind of it's possible you're not going to get all the nebulosity that you see in the image there but it is possible to get some of the details in the bubble um, it's kind of a fun challenge target and kind of off the beaten path from the normal you know summertime gems out there so that would be one of mine uh, that i would go after if you're looking for a little bit of a challenge especially this weekend later in the evening um good way to go so. Now, one of my favorite objects coming up this time of year up in Cassiopeia is IC59 and IC63, the ghost of Cassiopeia. Um, this is Gamma Cass, I believe. Pull that up. Right. Oh, Navi, I'm sorry. So the center star of Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia has got a lot of cool stuff floating around it too. A lot of dusty nebulas hitting up there. Um, but right the center star is called Navi, is the center star of Cassiopeia. There it is right there. You've got these two ghostly nebulas hanging out up there. They're only 610 light years away. Um, there's a lot of dust in this region, so any size of focal length, you can really make this look interesting. This again is a thousand millimeter full frame. There's all kinds of stuff up here. So try it experiment with this region um, does really well in hydrogen alpha if you're trying to do some narrow band work from in town maybe you want to try something that's a little bit different um, excellent target to go after with hydrogen alpha this is just visible light that you see there on the frame uh, luminance and color combined uh, i have seen this in a 14 inch telescope it's faint it's i think it's doable in a dark sky site uh, take your time, move the telescope side to side. Uh, it does help you see what moves with the star field and what's not just glare. This is a fun one to bust out for your friends because I can guarantee a large majority of people have not observed these. Um, 
So try it out. Uh, definitely try it out. It's it's a fun one to share with some friends. Here's the higher res shot. Um, you can see that nebulosity. I could even go further on the exposure here. There's some dark nebula out there, but the nebulosity actually stretches quite a bit off the fray. Excuse me. Uh, but these are two very nice nebulas that are hanging out up there in Cassiopeia. And that is rising towards the middle part of the evening. So very cool set of objects and there's all kinds of stuff that's still rising and of course you don't want to forget about your typical summertime objects you have you know m17 the swan m16 the eagle you still have m8 m20 like we talked about earlier the veil nebula i should have put the north american in here actually north american nebula uh, the crescent nebula the sadir region which is right at the center of just put this up here um there's just tons of stuff to actually observe this time of year. So you can keep yourself busy. Um, you know, there's the Sadir region right at the core of Cygnus. Right off of Deneb, you have uh, the North American. Over here on the wings of Cygnus, you still have the Veil Nebula. You have the Crescent Nebula, which is very cool over here. You have the Tulip Nebula. Um, if you actually want to know more about the Tulip Nebula, our buddy Trevor at Astro Backyard just released a video about the Tulip Nebula this morning. So go ahead and check that out as well. But there is a ton of targets to get this time of year um, from the summertime to all the cool uh, autumn stuff that's about to rise right now. Too many objects to list for deep skies. So you will keep yourself busy if you are going out observing this weekend. If you got good skies and a decent sized telescope, you're, you're gonna be busy. So uh, anyway, that's pretty much it for uh, this, this week. Um, if you guys need anything, definitely email us at info at skywatcherusa.com. Uh, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and like any of our videos. It really does help um, keep this going. Next week, we're doing an equipment talk. We're talking about the FlexTube SynScan Dobbs. Those are our collapsible go-to Dobsonian series. Uh, we're going to talk about the entire line from the 8-inch to the 16-inch. Um, now is actually a great time to have Dobsonians because they're a really effective way to get a large aperture system for not a ton of money. Um, so we'll be talking about our go-to Dobbs next week. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy that. But that pretty much wraps it up as far as this month and lots of stuff. Hope you have a good uh, dark sky uh, weekend. Uh, if there's any questions now is the time to throw them in there. Uh, I know there was one in here. Does anyone else remember buying comet catalogs that were... Oh yes. Yes. Don't buy comet catalogs. Just use like Sky Safari or something like that. Keeps it more up to date. Or go to Comet Hound and actually see what comets are up there. But that's it for the comments. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So have a good weekend, guys. Uh, clear skies. Enjoy the new moon weekend. Uh, if you've got any images, go ahead and share them with us. We'd love to see them as well. So thanks a lot. Take care, everyone, and be safe and clear skies. See ya.